In this class, we're going to look at how you determine the nature of a stationary point. So I'm making an assumption here you already know what a stationary point is. If not, then that's okay. We're going to look at examples anyway. But it might be better to check out the stationary point class first to get an introduction and then come back to this class. Or just follow along and then figure it out later. So a stationary point, as a reminder, is basically where the graph of a function changes direction. So you could have, for example, a, um, a parabola from a quadratic function. And here the parabola is sloping down the way and then it stops and then it's sloping up the way. Where it stops, where it decides to change direction, that's the point that we call a stationary point. So in this example here, over here in this part of the function, you've got a negative slope, so negative um, gradients on the tangent lines. Over here, you've got the function sloping up the way, so positive gradients on the tangent lines. So here we say the function is decreasing, here we say the function is increasing, but at this point here, we say the function is stationary. So at this point here, the derivative of the function is zero, the gradient of the tangent line is zero. So that, that's a recap from um, stationary point sort of theory. What we want to determine in this class is partly how to find the stationary points, but once you find them, which is an algebraic process, you don't know what type they are. So this type here is a minimum turning point. That's one of the, the sort of three types. If that parabola went the other way, then this point here, which would be the stationary point, is a maximum turning point. It doesn't have to be on a, on a parabola. It can be other types of functions. So for example, a quartic function goes a little bit like this. So on this quartic function, this would be a maximum turning point. So would that guy, this would be a, a minimum um, turning point. Sometimes we call these local maximums and minimums. So this is not the minimum value of the whole function because the function doesn't have a minimum. It carries on down the way forever, but we call it a local minimum. So it's at the, bot the bottom basically of that curve. So it's a localized minimum. So minimum turning point, maximum turning point. The other option is a point of inflection, which is where the graph is say increasing and then it stops and goes horizontal at that point and then increasing again. So positive gradient, zero, and then positive. So this one is a point of inflection. Okay, so I'll just say point of inflection. In particular, that one's called a rising point of inflection, and you also get a falling point of inflection, which would be like this guy here. So what we wanna do is kinda of keep these ideas in mind as we look at these two examples, and we're gonna find the stationary points of these functions, but then we're gonna try and determine which of these types of stationary point we've got. So the algebraic process for doing this doesn't really give us information about the type, so we're gonna to have to develop a method to take the algebra a little bit further. And one way you can do this is just to think about making a, not a perfect sketch of the graph, but just like a mini sketch. If you had a mini sketch, you would be able to say, hey, like, yeah, my mini sketch, my rough sketch tells me it's a maximum or a minimum or whatever the, the case may be. But regardless of which method we're gonna use, and I'll, and I'll talk about another method as well, um, we need to start by taking the derivative because that's how we find stationary points. So we're gonna take our dy dx here, using the power rule for this polynomial, we're gonna get x squared minus one. So that's quite a simple derivative. For the stationary points, we need to take this derivative and set it to zero. If you're not sure where I'm getting that from, check out the stationary point class and then come back into this one. Or just think about it as being zero because at these stationary points, the tangent line would be horizontal. So at each of these stationary points, if you drew a tangent line, it would have a horizontal, be a horizontal line, meaning that it's got a zero gradient or a zero derivative. So we need to go ahead and solve this quadratic equation now. This is a difference of squares. We can factorize that as x minus one, x plus one. And just going ahead to solve these two equations, we're going to get x equals one and x equals minus one. Okay, so um, I'm just going to maybe move this out of the way to get a bit more space. So that's cool. We now know that this guy here, this cubic function, has got two stationary points. We just don't know what type they are. So we found them, but we don't know which of the scenarios, the other one was a point of inflection, which of the scenarios we're uh, dealing with. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna construct a table called a, a nature table. 
And the nature table is going to be a, effectively a mini sketch of the graph. So it goes like this. So we put x in the first row, we put our derivative, so dy dx in the second uh, row, and the third row, we're just going to call that the shape of the graph, or the slope of the graph sometimes is how that's written. What we do, we put our stationary points into the x row, so put them in a numerical order, so minus one first, and then one, just going to make this a little longer. And what we're effectively going to do is look at values to the left and the right of the stationary points. Because if you imagine being to the left of this stationary point, if you test the derivative at the left of this point, it should come out to be positive, because derivative and gradient are the same thing, because the function is sloping up, or the graph is sloping up. To the right of that stationary point should come out to be negative, because it's decreasing, sloping down. So you can effectively build up a mini sketch of the graph using the derivative, because derivative tells you gradient, which basically tells you the shape of the graph. Choose any value between these two. I'm going to choose zero for that one. Sometimes you've got to be careful with using zero. In this case, it's okay. If you've got fractions, for example, try to avoid zero. And we're just going to put that value and choose two others into the derivative and test the values. I'm going to choose a number smaller than minus one. I'm going to go for minus 10. That's quite a nice number to work with. And positive 10 over here. You can choose any numbers. As long as this number is bigger than one, as long as this number is smaller than minus one, then you'll get the correct information. At the stationary points, these two, the derivative is zero, so we can just put the zeros in there straight away. Now we just need to test the derivative of these values. So at zero, the derivative is zero squared minus one, which is negative. So I'm not gonna put in the actual value, the numerical value, just whether it's positive or negative, because that's all we need to determine whether the graph is sloping up or sloping down. 10 squared is 100, minus one, 99, positive. Minus 10 squared is also 100, so that's also positive. So that tells us that the shape here goes up, zeros, goes down, zeros out again, and then it goes back up. What does that tell us? Well, that's a mini sketch of the graph. In reality, it would just take that shape but be curved, making the familiar cubic shape. So it tells us that the point here, the one that's got an x coordinate of minus 1, that point is a maximum turning point. This one here, which is down at the bottom, is a local, probably local, well, definitely local, uh, minimum turning point. That's the point, it's at 1. So we're just taking this kind of graphical method uh, called a nature table to find the information that we need. Okay, cool. Taking the same method and scooting onto this example, this is not in a differentiable form. I'm just going to start by manipulating it by multiplying out the bracket. So we get 2x squared minus x cubed. That's now turned into a cubic. Because it's a cubic function, it might have two stationary points. It might only have one maximum of two stationary points for that type of function. Taking our derivative dy dx, we get 4x minus 3x squared. Setting that equal to zero for finding the stationary points, we get 4x minus 3x squared equals zero. This is a quadratic equation to solve. This one we did by factorizing into two brackets. For this one, we're going to use a common factor of x. Just because it came out to be a slightly different format, Still going to get two solutions, so the first one, x equals 0. Second one we get by solving 4 minus 3x equals 0, which is going to be x equals uh, 4 over 3. So those are our two stationary points. That's fine. We want to determine their nature. So we're going to determine their nature by using the, the nature table. The other way you can do this is by taking what's called the second derivative. Second derivative test is when you, well the second derivative is when you differentiate this again to get the derivative of the original function taken twice. And there's a way of connecting the second derivative to whether the function is a maximum or a minimum. I'm not going to show that method here because I don't find it to be as effective. I find that it tends to cause confusion. And also I think having a sketch of the graph allows you to answer more question types. So just be aware that if you've seen the second derivative test for finding the nature of stationary points, that is applicable here, but it's not the technique that I'm going to show. So we're going to use the, the nature table again. So just putting in our information, just trying to build up a mini sketch of the graph. Putting in our stationary points first of all, so 0, 4 over 3. It's fine that that come out to be a fraction, it could be anything. Let's go for, um, I'm going to go for minus 1 this time. In fact, no, I'm going to make that minus 10. 
Let's go for a number between zero and four thirds. So I can go for one, that's quite convenient. And then a number over here is 10. You'll learn by experience which numbers to use. I mean, they've got to be in the right position. Like you can't have a 10 in here because it's not between those two numbers. But I find that using tens and minus tens is really helpful because when you square them, you get nice clear numbers like 100 or if you cube it, um, a thousand. If you use a small number like minus two or three, it's just more difficult to calculate with. So we can put the derivative straight in for the two stationary points. So zero there, zero there. Putting the one into our derivative, we get um, four minus three, which is positive. Putting minus 10 in there, we get minus 40 minus 300, which is negative. And then putting 10 in there, we would get the same, uh, well, we get 40, positive 40, minus 300, so that's going to be negative. Notice that these alternate if you've got a maximum or a minimum, because it has to go either positive to negative or negative to positive. If they don't alternate, that would have to be a point of inflection, like positive, zero, positive, or negative, zero, negative. Okay, so that tells us that our function's graph slopes down and then it goes zero at the stationary point, so it's flat, just at that one point. It's not really a line, it's just flat at that one point. Then it goes up, then it flattens out again at the stationary point and then it goes back down. So just filling in the shape, remembering that this was a cubic function originally and it goes down and goes back up and goes back down. Notice that this cubic went up and then down and then up and this one goes down, up and then down. That's because this one's got a negative x cubed term. So they start by going down the way and then back up. These guys with the positive start by going up and then back, back down. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that we've got these two stationary points here and here. And this one here, the one that's associated with an x coordinate of zero is a minimum turning point. And this one here is a maximum turning point. So there's quite a lot going on in this topic. Um, learning to work the nature tables is not too bad. It takes a little experience, but there's quite a lot to piece together. So these are important question types. They're generally um, worth quite a lot of marks on tests and exams and things. And they're definitely worth spending a lot of time practicing because you never quite know what the function type it's going to be like. So you need to adapt the, the technique to different functions. And just to get a bit of experience with the tables, um, which will just prevent making, making mistakes. So definitely check out a few practice questions on this topic.